close to no, oh, I'll get it. Wait, you go to that. Are we on? Okay. Hey, everybody. Mike McPherson, KT19. Uh, and I'm going to talk about 3D printing tonight. So, uh, last time, Benjamin talked about subtractive manufacturing. Uh, subtractive manufacturing. Come on. All right. Oh, this meeting is being recorded. I have to say, got it. <laughs> All right. Subtractive manufacturing is think sculpting, uh, sculpture. So you know uh, Michelangelo, Bellini. They they don't see a block of marble. They see the David or the Pieta or Leopoldan, whatever, uh, and they start chipping away marble until it looks the way they imagine it's going to look. That's called subtractive manufacturing. So most of your traditional machining processes are subtractive manufacturing, blades, all that sort of stuff. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is additive manufacturing. There you start with nothing and you build up the part that you want to, want to create. And there are lots of different technologies. Um, and I'm only going to talk about two of them tonight, and I only do one of them. So the first two are the most common. And in fact, the first one was the uh, was the one that started all of this, and it, it's been quite a while ago. I think coming up on like the 50th anniversary of the, of the first 3D printer. Um, and it was <laughs> it was a that polymer, polymerization printer. That's a fancy word for, uh, most people call it stereolithography. It's a fancy word for taking a photosensitive epoxy and curing it with a laser. And I'll show you a picture of it in a minute here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about both of these in a little bit more detail. Uh, material extrusion, extrusion or fused deposition modeling is what I'm doing back there on that printer. And that's what most people who do 3D printing are doing. And in FDM, you're taking uh, plastic melting it, putting it through an extruder, and then cooling it so it solidifies. In both of these cases, uh, you you have some sort of uh, XY control. Either you're scanning a laser in, in the X and Y axes, or you're moving the extruder in the X and Y. And then the, the print bed, the part that the pieces, working pieces attached to, moves in the case of a uh, or or can move in in the case of an FDM usually the the extruder moves um, it's on a gantry in a uh, bat polymerization or stereolithography usually the print bed moves up and the part prints upside down I've got a video I'll tell you in a minute and then the others uh, are much more exotic these are these are commercial techniques that involve uh, material jetting and binder jetting involve powdered binders and powdered print materials uh, and sprayed it apart using a technology that's not very different from inkjet printing. Um, uh, powder bed fusion is similar, except it uses lasers to melt. This is powder bed fusion is used a lot for 3D printing metal. And it uses high powered lasers to melt the, the metal powder in exactly the places you want it to melt. So you've got this sort of cloud of, of metal dust and the laser zaps the places that, that you want there to be metal deposited and the metal melts and that cools. And uh, sheet lamination is, it, a lot of people have done this. You take a lot of layers of uh, stuff, you cut out shapes in each layer, you laminate them together with some sort of adhesive and you end up with a solid. It's It's sort of a, manual version of what we're doing back there. And then directed energy deposition. It, it's a lot like powder bed fusion, except using, I don't know, death rays. <laughs> I don't understand it very well. All right, so stereolithography, you've got a vat full of this polymer. You have uh, some sort of light source, typically a laser. 
this one is actually going down. Uh, the one I'll show you here in a minute is going up. So in this one, the print bed would have started right at the top of the vat full of liquid. And as you and as the laser scans each layer, the print bed moves down and the laser scans the next layer. Uh, and most of the new machines, modern machines go the other way, but it's the same idea. So let's see if I can get this video to play because it's cool. Hmm. Oh, I see it's zoom slide thing. So they're plotting this uh, plate with the epoxy and then dipping the print bed just barely into the epoxy. And then they've got a set of mirrors. They're going to scan the layer from the bottom through this transparent glass and light up the spots that they want to cure. And once, once they've done that for that entire slice of the model, the bed moves up a tiny fraction of a, a millimeter and they do it again. And you end up with, you can make, with uh, stereolithography, you can make really complex parts. Uh, the, um, uh, precision, the achievable precision with stereo lithography is higher than it is with fused deposition modeling because there you've got a mechanical limit. You've got to make a hole in the extruder, and there's only so small that you can go and still push plastic through it. With this, you can pretty much focus the laser beam as small as you want, you want it to be. All right, now. Well, Hold on. No, we're going to get there. Well, he's working on that. I'm, I'm zooming in on Mike's uh, 3D printer that's working there in the background. All I can say is I'm glad I'm not the only one who had trouble getting it to go past the videos and the slides. <laughs> yeah, which is really all right. Okay, so FDM, fused deposition. So this, uh, the, the idea is similar. You're taking some sort of material and depositing, depositing it layer by layer to create a, a solid. In this case, though, you've got um, uh, the bed typically uh, stays fixed. They're showing it moving here, but in most modern FDM printers, the bed stays fixed and the extruders on a gantry. You've got this filament that uh, it comes on a spool and is fed using stepper motors pushed into this extruder, which is hot. Uh, I meant for the filament I'm using back there, about 200 degrees centigrade. Uh, it, and and it, the, the extruder is designed so that the filament doesn't melt until the very last part. It melts just in the last millimeter or so of the extruder. And then there are fans blowing on the work uh, to solidify the plastic just as quickly as possible. Uh, so, this was the sort of granddaddy of, of uh, consumer 3D printers for a long time. This is the Prusa i3 uh, designed by a guy named Prusa. Um, and uh, this is an interesting, this is an interesting technology. So the, uh, the Prusa i3 is what's referred to as a RepRap printer. And RepRap stands for, you remember what RepRap stands for, John? I'm blanking on it right now. Uh, replicating, 
something. It's it's our robot overlords taking over the planet. The goal the goal of a reprint freezer is for it to be able to print itself. A, a, a pure rep rep printer could print all of its parts. Uh, most of them don't quite get there. You've got some metal. Usually you've got some screws uh, to move things around and some stepper motors and stuff that the printer can't print. Yeah, it's, but it's coming. But the goal is to be able to print yourself. Uh, this is what I've got. This is the, uh, well, Two years ago was the darling of, of home 3D printing. Uh, it really changed the game. Um, this printer, it, it's from an outfit called Creality, which is a Chinese company. Uh, it list price, 200 bucks. And it is a really good printer. It, it, prints, it prints way above its price range. Um, and there are lots of modifications you can make to it. There's a joke uh, in the 3D printing world. Um, what do you print with your new 3D printer? Parts for your 3D printer. Because <laughs> uh, there are all sorts of modifications you can do for your 3D printer. And, and everybody who buys one spends a fair bit of time in the first year printing little gizmos to add on to their printer to make it work better or, or look prettier or whatever. Um, so I've done, in fact, uh, probably a couple hundred bucks worth of work on that one. So as it sits back there, it's probably more like 400, but that's still cheap. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that you'd pay a couple thousand for a printer like that. Um, so here we go. I'm gonna get stuck on a video again. So this is, <laughs> I forgot about Zoom slowing everything down. We'll see how this goes. This guy, uh, he does the most amazing time lapses of um, 3D printing. So this is this is what it looks like, the filament coming out of the extruder. I wonder how, how many times you've had to try to get it to <laughs> So uh, he does these time lapses with fabulous lighting. And uh, a camera on a gantry that moves around, but I mean, he's he really put a huge amount of energy into it, and it's absolutely fascinating. But you can see how the thing grows layer by layer, and uh, you don't see the the extruder here because he's doing the time lapse. He's got the printer set up so when it finishes a layer, it pulls the extruder back out of the way, takes a frame, oh, and then wow. does the next layer. So all you see is this thing growing by magic. So you get the idea there. And now I can see this will let me move on. Yes. Is there, and everybody's identified that as a graboid out of the out of the movie Tremors. Or, or a sandworm and uh, dune. No, that's a sandworm dune. Okay. Could be, yeah. I don't know. One or the other. <clears throat> And uh, so that printer right now is 249 on Amazon. Yeah. Oh, it's gone up. Oh. But that includes shipping. <laughs> no, that's Amazon Prime. Yeah. All right. Wow. Uh, one of the other really amazing things about 3D printing is that you can print things with moving parts. Uh, you really have to start thinking about creating something differently. So this box here was printed in one piece. It wasn't a symbol. It has a spring. It has gears. It has a lever to release the latch, all printed in one piece. Because you know, you're building it up layer by layer. I printed chain and each link sits on the print bed at a 45 degree angle and they don't touch and, you know you're building them up like that and so when you get done you've got a length of chain it, it's really pretty amazing all right so let's talk about Talk about what you can print with. 
Keeps going back to the Okay, materials. There are a ton of materials you can print with, um, and they have different properties. I'm printing with something called PLA or polylactic acid. Uh, it's uh, it's cheap. Uh, it is pretty tough. It's surprisingly tough. That's what I do most of my printing with. It's easy to print with. Um, rel relatively, uh, it, it, you don't have to have an exotic printer in order to print with it. You don't have to have really good environmental control to print PLA. Uh, you can, and it doesn't stink. <laughs> Although there is some concern that there might be some micro particles coming off the printer. Uh, I think the jury's still out on that one, but it's possible that it's emitting some particulate stuff that you not want to breathe. I don't hang around the printer when it prints. It's in, in my workshop in the basement. And I start something and I go someplace else and, and wait for it to finish. And it is, uh, with an asterisk, biodegradable. Um, <clears throat> if you just throw PLA in landfill, it'll take about 100 years to break down. Uh, there is a, a fairly straightforward chemical process that you can do. You grind it up, you treat it with a, a particular chemical, and then it breaks down in months. So uh, it, it's relatively easy to make it go away. And it can be recycled. Uh, the, uh, you, can, you can take your old PLA, melt it, and put it through an extruder and wind it onto a reel, and you've got a reel of PLA that's almost as good as the first time. So it's a, it's a really nice material. It has some issues. Uh, it, it melts at a temperature that's low enough that if, say, you used it for um, uh, a centerpiece for your dipole, uh, when the sun hit it and got hot, it would start to droop a little bit. Uh, it, so you don't want to put it out, put it someplace where it's going to get really hot. It is kind of brittle. Uh, it's not food safe. So if you're into printing uh, beer steins and that kind of stuff, you want to use something else. Uh, and like I say, it's not good for outdoor use. The other more, most common thing that people print with is ABS. This is what Legos are made out of. Uh, incredibly mm -hmm. tough. Uh, it probably takes a million years to break down in the landfill. Uh, it is tough to print. It's it's really twitchy. You have to control the environment. Most people who print ABS have a box around their printer and it's heated. Uh, and so the, the temperature of the inside the box where the printer is is maintained a, a steady temperature, no drafts. ABS doesn't like drafts. It'll crack or warp. So it's pretty twitchy. But it's good for outdoor use if you paint it. It's not UV gate, it's not UV resistant, but uh, otherwise it's it's fine for outdoor use. And um, this thing called PET G, uh, polyethylene paraphthalate glycol, I think I did that right. Um, that is UV resistant and it's a lot easier to print. And I printed with some of that. In fact, the uh, uh, if you go back and look at the printer, the the blue housing that has the the cooling pans mounted in it on my printer uh, is printed. I printed it myself out of that bean uh, and it turned out really great. And then TPU is the other one that's most common. Um, TPU is flexible and it comes in all sorts of different degrees of, of flexibility. And so you can use it to print um, vibration isolators. You can use it to print uh, hinges. Uh, anything that you need to be a little bit squishy, you can print with TPU. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, and then there are some. Go back. Uh, then there are some more exotic materials that most people, most hobbyists, don't get into. These are uh, more for the commercial crowd. And three D printing is a really big deal in industry. Uh, it, you know, think 40, 40 years ago. Uh, when Ford was going to make a new car, they made a model of the car out of wax or out of clay. Uh, they had artists, sculpt sculptors on staff who would make a clay model of the new whatever. And, um, and then they tear it apart and make another one after they made the changes. 
Well, now they're prototyping parts using 3D printing. So what would have taken machinists or sculptors days, you can print on a commercial printer, which is much faster than hobby printer. You can print a, a, a prototype of a part in, in hours. So it's really revolutionized manufacturing. And in fact, uh, a lot of companies are starting to, uh, for, for things that are relatively limited run and have, uh, and they want to be able to print shapes that are difficult to machine, they're starting to use 3D printing for actual production parts. Uh, one of the jet engine manufacturers is printing turbine blades on a 3D printer out of carbon fiber. So uh, this stuff's all hard to print. You're, you're probably not going to mess with any of that. I have some. I have seen uh, some people printing nylon at home. Oh, and this PVA is interesting. So a lot of a lot of parts. Um, if you have overhangs, uh, one of the one of the other things you have to get used to, besides thinking about new new ways of thinking about designing things, you also have to remember that you can't print anything there. So if you've got an overhang, you can't, right. if it's very, if it's very big, if it's just a little bit, you can probably get away with it. But if, if it's more than a millimeter or, so, or two, you're going to have to have something under it to print on. And that's called uh, support. And so I'm going to pass these two pieces around. These pieces I printed with support because they've got some horizontal overhangs that would otherwise have just turned into spaghetti. And um, if you want to, so the, the support is this sort of flimsy looking stuff on the outside, and it should just snap out maybe a tool to get it started. But that's what it looks like with support. So you print it with support to hold up the parts that would otherwise be in the thin air. And then you go back and you pop the support out, and, and it's quite easy. You just take. I uh, usually use a pair of pliers, and just get in there and start grabbing it and ripping it out. And um, uh, so this PVA is uh, water soluble. So if you have a printer that can print with two different uh, materials at the same time, you can print the support with oh, PVA, yeah. and then you put it in a, in water. And the, the PVA dissolves, and you're left with your uh, your PLA part or whatever. Uh, and there, there's another uh, material like that that you have to use a solvent to get rid of, and that's used with ABS. Uh, so what can you print? Well, there. Uh, I'll show you in a minute here. There are uh, websites where people upload things that they have designed. So everybody starts by printing. Cool things that they download off the web, uh, but you can design you can design your own too. But it's always worth looking first. You, you're very likely to find somebody who's already done, even for ham radio, somebody who's already done something that that you're interested in. So, for example, um, this is a little antenna winder for your soda antenna. It's got a place to put in a, a panel mount connector, mm -hmm. solder your wires to the back, wrap them around, got your insulators for the end. You've got a nice little soda antenna that I printed this afternoon. Took about, took about an hour and a half. Right. Uh, did you download that or did yeah. you design you download it? I downloaded that. Uh, obsessed with your power pole connectors coming apart. <laughs> I gotta say, I've never had power pole connectors come apart, but a lot of people are clearly worried about this because I searched for power pole flips, and oh man, it's a lot of people have designed power pole flips. So why don't we pass those around? Um, the end of wireless are making boxes to put the toilet coals in for the infrared uh, uh, half wavelength antennas. Yeah. Yeah, so for your um, balloons or uh, coils, yeah, you can make uh, enclosures for that sort of stuff. Um, this has solved all sorts of problems that I didn't think had solutions. So 
How many of you have a bunch of microphones with a bear RJ and a bear just begging to have the clip ripped off? <laughs> right? Nipple yeah. yeah. that clips onto the end. And now your little clip isn't going to rip off. It takes like two minutes to bring it. Two minutes to bring it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And what it costs, the more the new end costs. Oh, yeah. Well, not yeah. very much. And, but, uh, yeah. but you've got to go out and buy the tools, yeah. and then you yeah. got to buy all the tools. And then uh, the fun part happens when you start designing stuff yourself. So uh, here are a couple of project boxes that I designed. Um, you know, honestly, I don't remember what's going on this one. <laughs> It's for some project that I started and haven't finished yet. Um, this one is, uh, it's an audio mixer, uh, the, uh, the portable wing link gateway that, uh, that I built. Um, I want to be able to do that tour and bar up at the same time. And so this is an audio mixer, so I do have the Paxo modem and the sound card interface hooked up at the same time. And um, uh, and um, MG Chemicals makes uh, uh, spray uh, mixture of silver and copper in a spray can uh, to spray the inside for shielding because this stuff doesn't block our end. But you just spray the inside of the box with this silver and copper mixture spray, and you've got uh, a shielded enclosure. And let's see. Oh. Leg for a robot puppy. Uh, my granddaughter and I are building a robot puppy. She said, Grandpa, I want to build a robot. <laughs> and so this, the plastic is all 3D printed on that printer. Thank you. Oh, this is great. Um, the other thing people are obsessed with is cases for their raspberry Pi. Uh, I bet you could find a thousand people who have designed a case for their pie. Oh, yeah. um, uh, I, I actually printed this one for one of mine. It, it worked really well. And um, or you can have your Raspberry Pi look like an Apple Lisa, the predecessor to the Macintosh. Oh my God! This is uh, they didn't sell very many of these. Talk about retro, but it's only it's only it's only about that big. But uh, but that's what they look like. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll show you the uh, if we have time. I'll show you in a minute here. This this is a shot of uh, a project box made using what's called a parametric editor. Uh, a parametric editor is one in which uh, probably lots of you have seen people designing 3D things by uh, click and drag and it makes a sphere and you grab the sphere and move it and it's all graphical interface. A parametric model order is, the, is sort of coming at, coming at it from the other direction. You, you write basically a program that describes the object that you wanted to make. And the power of that is uh, you're, you're saying you put a square 1.2 millimeters on a side at this point in space, and it's exactly 1.2 millimeters, and it's exactly in that at that point in space on these uh, on these graphical design yeah. programs. Getting things to line up can be a real pain in the neck, like vector graph. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. but here you're, you're building a mathematical model. Yeah. Uh, so I use something called OpenSCAD. It's an open source parametric modeler. And that's what I designed with boxes. Very cool. Uh, there are places to open SCAD. So I noticed the one box you had. Sorry to interrupt. But I noticed the one box you made has the the nuts inside of it. Yes. Did you mm -hmm. do that in the middle of the process, or no? Not, or did they just drop it? Did everybody notice that in this box there are there are nuts in the places where the screws go. The lid's going to screw on and, and where the board is screwed down. Um, those are called heat set nuts. They are, uh, I should have brought one. Um, they're brass. They're, um, you can get them in all sorts of different sizes, both metric and, and uh, not metric, SAE. 
And um, you use a special tip on your soldering iron that fits in the hole. And uh, and it heats up that brass and you just <clears throat> really just the weight of the soldering iron is enough to push it into the plastic. And the outside of it is neural. Okay. So that, you, you push it into the plastic and when the plastic resets, it forms around the knurling on the outside of that nut and it's in there, it's not coming out. And, uh, and so you can have nice metal hardware on your 3D printed plastic boxes. Neat. Sorry to interrupt. It's really cool. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get really crazy, print yourself a house. <laughs> Let's go for brown. Hmm. Printing with, uh, with cement concrete. Printing with concrete. Yeah. Yeah. And it's exactly the same technology, except they're not heating the, con the concrete to 200 centigrade. Uh, but it's exactly the same technology. It's just a really <laughs> big. They but bring you it can, and build it on site. Prints it like an 800 square foot house, a, a single story. Yeah. And you can print it in about 24 hours. That's amazing. So they're really looking at this for like disaster yeah. after disaster, building mm -hmm. low income housing where you've got the entire structure together in a day. And now you can get all the wiring and the plumbing and everything else done and get the house built in a couple of weeks. Oh, just fast. Get to the end here. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to try a couple of demo things here. Uh, so that the, the granddaddy or, or grandmother or whatever of, uh, of the ultimate uh, share your model of the world insights is called Thingiverse. Uh, there are now a bunch of alternatives. Um, some of them just general purpose like this. Uh, so you'll find a little bit of everything uploaded here. Like you know, the hat from Harry Potter that tells you which house you're going to, or if you really want to print a plastic gun and get shot by the police, you can print plastic gun, <laughs> or flowers, or Hogwarts, or Harry Potter <laughs> since a lot. Um, well, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, I don't think you can print that. Yeah, you can't print that. Uh, <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I walked right into that. that was perfect timing, right? <laughs> All righty. So uh, you uh, you know, we pick something. Let's go. Let's go look at the. Uh, let's let's look at something interesting. So here is. I love this one. Here is a lathe. Uh, so. This would this would be sort of the lathe equivalent of a rep wrap. <laughs> you know, you print most of the parts using a 3D printer, print them out of plastic, and you're going to need some uh, threaded rod and uh, and a, a motor and you know some stuff like that and a comp little computer to control it. But most of the parts are printed with 3D printing, and so somebody designed this because they thought it was cool. And they uploaded the files that describe all the parts. And you can download them. And you go down here, here, here are all of the files that you feed to the printer to, uh, to print those parts. And then you put it together when you're done. Um, what you do with one of these is take, I'm going to download this one. And then I'm going to start up a piece of cotton mm -hmm. software. There, there are several, uh, well, there are a number of what are called slicers. So this is programmed, once you've made a 3D model, you need to prepare it for the printer. All the printer knows is X, Y, and Z. And am I putting, am I squirting plastic out now or not? That's all it knows. And so you've got to take your 3D model and you've got to turn it into something that the printer understands. And you do that with what's called a slicer. So I'm going to import that on right here. And there we go. 
I'm going to import that. So here is that piece, the 3D model, and I'm going to slice it. And uh, and the slicer tells me it, it <clears throat> divides it up into layers, and I can bring get my fingers to work right. So I can move up and down the stack and see what it's going to do at each layer. And and this then can be sent to the printer. This will create a, a file that has something called G code. And um, this morning I printed a piece that shows you what it looks like inside. So in, inside of these things, I stopped I, I stopped it. I must have put it in my pocket. <laughs> I know I printed one. Um so if it's more than a, a millimeter thick or so, uh, you can you can hold this up to the light actually. Take this and hold it up to the light and you can see inside. Uh, oh, yeah. The inside is sort of a honeycomb. Yeah. And you have a lot of control over that. You can control the pattern, you can control how dense the honeycomb is, all the way up to solid. Uh, and the, so for parts that you don't need to have a lot of strength, you can that, that was printed at about 20 percent so only about 20 percent of the interior volume is actually filled with plastic but it's filled with a pattern that is very strong and so it actually has quite a bit of strength but it uses a whole lot less plastic it prints a whole lot faster and uh, um, is lighter so so the, the the slicing of this part suggests that it's being printed that that's Part is being printed vertically. Yeah. Why, why would what would be the advantage of doing that vertically as opposed to doing it horizontally? Uh, none. So I would, <laughs> before I actually printed it, I would go like this. Oh, you just and say I'm going to put that surface down on the right. And now I'm going to slice it again. And now it's like this. <clears throat> Asked and answered, and you can see you can see this uh, fill. That's called fill on the inside. So you know, in Homer, I used to live in a large state northwest here, up in Alaska. Uh, the library, the uh, there was a maker group mm -hmm. that was after school for the elementary school mm -hmm. kids that Victor, my son, was a part of. And they had they did three D printing, and this was years ago. Yeah. And uh, but they were learning uh, at the time Google control it. They were using SketchUp. Yep. You can use and it went from SketchUp things. to the slicer, and then to the printer. Yep. And so my my son was doing this when he was like in fifth fifth grade. So see, he's in college now. It's first year. So yeah, that's like eight years ago. Well, then you know the neat thing is this library has, a printer. has the printers and the software, and they'll even give you the plastic to let you learn how to do it. Yeah. So the library offers a program right here yep. uh, where, where you can get in and, and learn. Nice. Mike, I, I don't want to rush, but we have to be completely out of the room in roughly 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to show you one more thing real quick here, then, and, uh, and then I'll take some questions. Um, I just wanted to show you an example of creating something. So this is uh, this program called OpenSCAD, and um, this is a, a parametric modeler. It's very difficult to do with track bed. Um, so uh, it's called a parametric modeler because you can go over here and say, I would like the inside width of the box to be not 70 millimeters, but uh, 100 millimeters. And it will recalculate. So you can, and this stuff over here is the program that this person wrote. That describes that box. So uh, you can. Um, so in fact, these boxes I did that way. I used somebody else's. I I tried. I I tried a couple of 
parametric box models that people had already done. And, and the problem was, it's great as long as you want the holes where they think the holes ought to go. If you want to do anything different, like their model has three holes and you need five, well, you got to practically rewrite your thing anyway. So I didn't know. Uh, it's it's not hugely difficult. Um, so I've got a kind of a template that I can use and, and ramp up or down the number of holes and what surface they're on and that kind of stuff. But it's the same idea. So this is how you create <coughs> something from scratch. Uh, or one way you create something from scratch, or you can use something like SketchUp. There's something called Tinkercad, which uh, oh, is, yeah. is provided by AutoCAD. And as long as you're not doing anything commercial with it, it's free. Uh, and that's a graphical modeling program. So I think that's pretty much what I have. Um, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Thank, thank you didn't mention in the chat that Fusion is also free. So Yes, as long as for not commercial. So if you're just using it for your hobby to make stuff for you know, radio or whatever, uh, it, it's also free. And that's okay. a so what did you make back there? Uh, so I made another one of these little things. So let's let's tear this up. I was hoping somebody else would do it for me, but nobody's brave enough. <laughs> you have to get it started, and then it just sort of pops off. Okay. That thing of a Bob website, they probably got two hundred different files of stuff for ham. Yeah. Radio mic mic holders and parts and pieces and yeah, all sorts of stuff. Mike, if you're not going to use the uh, screen, I'll stop the sharing yeah. so they can see you. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. See me struggling with this piece here. Seems to me, Mike, I don't get it in the sense that you say you separate the extruder and printhead. Seems like the extruder could be the printhead. Uh, they are the same thing. Oh, it is. Yes. Yeah, oh, okay. just different words for the same oh, thing. Okay, I didn't get that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so it, um, mm -hmm. yep. on a 3D printer, it's yeah. an extruder. And, and, right. if, and if anybody's right. ever done so a glue gun, that's what right. an extruder's yeah. like. But, but it's a it's it is. Really. It is. It's 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 yeah, yeah. It's for an extruder. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, nice. Thank you. I don't know if anybody's noticed, but over the years, uh, this guy has done a lot of presentations for the club. Uh, I think he must be one of the leading presenters. Uh, like we really appreciate everything you you brought to our club. 